Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Church. Actually, you're not here. Uh, we're recording this uh, early this morning, uh, Sunday. Driving in, it was pretty slippery, and so we're glad that you're going to stay home. But it felt important to share with you uh, the message God has for us. We're not able to kind of do all of the music, and especially not able to do baptisms. Uh, we'll do that next week. Um, but uh, the Lord has a message for us from His Word. And so we're videotaping this and recording this so that we can uh, share this with you. I do want to say a special thank you to Dave Ellis, who's the chairman of our elders. It's his decision as to whether or not we have services and driving in this morning uh, at 7.30 or so uh, to come here to film this. It's pretty bad out there, so uh, thank you uh, to the Lord for allowing us to be able to do this. Thanks to Dave for making that decision. And thank you, uh, God, for the technology to be able to uh, share this message with you from Matthew. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to have a service just like we, a sermon just like we normally do. So uh, let me lead us in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you that your word does not return void. Uh, and Lord, though the sanctuary is for the most part empty, uh, God, you are present here where two or three gather together. And so, Lord, for those who are here working. Uh, God, thank you that their presence allows your spirit to be powerfully present. Thank you, Lord, for the technology to be able to share this uh, with uh, our church family and with others who you will have listen. Lord, we pray that even in these unique circumstances that you would speak powerfully through your word and that, God, we might hear and respond and be changed because of it. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So this past Monday, uh, the University of Michigan won a national championship in football. And one of the things I most enjoyed about that whole thing was at the end of the football game, they interviewed Jim Harbaugh, who is the Michigan coach. And he shared, first and foremost, his gratitude to God for guiding him through the Holy Spirit uh, during the process. And I just, that warmed my heart. He also talked about his work family, meaning his team, and his home family, and how those are both important priorities to him. Uh, that was clearly in evidence as he honored his father and mother, and you could see the love that he had for his football players. And so I've often heard uh, Jim Harbaugh talk, and he's very clear that his priorities in life are first and foremost faith, then family, and then football. And I have to imagine that in order to reach the pinnacle of college football, there's probably been some challenges to keep those priorities. Now, I have no idea if the recruiting scandals or the sign-stealing allegations are signs of whether or not he's allowed those priorities to get out of uh, whack. I don't know those things, but I do know that it's incredibly hard to keep the most important thing the most important thing. And I'm sure there were challenges along the way uh, to not have faith and then family and then football be the priority. Now, thinking about priorities and what Jim Harbaugh said on Monday night reminded me of another footballer. This one was a British footballer, by which I mean a soccer player, uh, David Beckham, whose documentary I recently watched on Netflix. I was especially interested in this documentary because when we lived in England, David Beckham was playing uh, for the English national team, and it was a big deal. And so watching this documentary, I uh, just was interested in that sort of period of time. And uh, seeing the documentary was a reminder again of the incredible challenges of keeping the most important thing the most important thing. Throughout the documentary, throughout the story, it was unclear if football was the most important thing or family or fame. And at times it went back and forth and you could see the struggle between the priorities, which was going to win out, which was going to be most important. Now, you don't have to be a professional athlete or coach at the highest level to feel the challenges of trying to identify the most important thing, the priority in life, and then fighting to keep that thing the most important thing. Well, this morning we have the opportunity to hear Jesus talk to us about what is supposed to be the most important thing, and we get to hear an encouragement uh, from him uh, through his word. So let me invite you to take a Bible and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. Matthew, chapter 19. I don't know if any of you have uh, borrowed a church Bibles and so have them at home. If you do, 
That's page 800, but hopefully you're using uh, one of your Bibles. Uh, Matthew chapter 19. I'm going to begin reading in verse 16, and there's some tricky things to this story that we're about to look at, so I'm going to kind of slowly work through it verse by verse as we go. So we're going to stop along the way just to make comments and explain what's going on. So Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 16. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, What good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now Luke tells us that this is a rich young ruler. He probably rules or works in the synagogue and he's a wealthy person. And he comes to Jesus with a question. The question is, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now again, because he works in a synagogue and he's probably a observant Jewish young man... He's asking a question that's very important in the Old Testament, an important question that God has revealed. What happens after death? And so the Old Testament has a lot to say about the fact that God does not want death to be the final thing in life. For example, in Daniel chapter 12, uh, we read this prophecy. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, Others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So Daniel is talking about the fact that uh, at the end there will be resurrection in two groups. Some will rise to everlasting life. Others to shame and everlasting contempt. Well, this young man wants to know, well, how can I be part of the group that rises to everlasting life? That's the question that he's asking. He doesn't want everlasting contempt. He doesn't want everlasting shame. He wants to experience the blessings of the kingdom of God forever and ever. He wants everlasting life. Verse 17 Jesus says, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Now this is one of the reasons why we're going through this passage slowly is because Jesus is doing something very subtle here. You might think at first blush that what he's saying is is the way that you become a person who experiences everlasting life is by keeping commandments. But I want you to notice the man asked, what good thing must I do? Jesus responds by trying to subtly push him away from thinking about the things he does to the person that he does them for. Jesus says there is only one who is good. He is trying to push this man's attentions onto God the Father who is the giver of commands. But because the man is driving the conversation, it's going to become clear later. Jesus doesn't believe that you receive eternal life by keeping commands. He believes it's a gift from God. But because the man is driving the conversation, Jesus is only subtly pushing him in a direction, but allows the conversation to unfold so that he, Jesus, can make the point he wants to make. So we go on in verse 18. The man replies, well, which ones, which commands do I have to keep in order to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbors as yourselves. Most of these come from the Ten Commandments. Now, if Jesus thought that you got into heaven or you experienced eternal life by keeping the commands, he would have listed all of the commands because it's important that we keep them all. But Jesus doesn't think you get to heaven by keeping commands, but he's following this conversation the way it's going because he wants to make an important point. And so Jesus lists some of the Ten Commandments. 
Now again, this is a rich young ruler from the synagogue, but even today, the Ten Commandments are some of the most well-known verses in the Bible. They're very familiar to people, and they come in very specific order. Let me show you a quick graphic just to remind ourselves about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments fall naturally into two groups. The first four commandments are really focused on loving God. The last six commandments are focused on loving others. The reason they come in this order is that in order to love God, we demonstrate our love for God by loving others. And in order to love others, we have to first start with our love for God. So the first four commandments are about loving God. The last six commandments are about loving others. In verse 18, Jesus is referring only to commands from the second half. He says, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, interestingly, everybody knows the order of the Ten Commandments today and back then. And everybody would notice, this young, rich young ruler would notice, that Jesus has changed the order. So here on the screen we have the order that Jesus lists them in. He goes six, seven, eight, nine, five, and then he adds the love your neighbor as yourself. So you'll notice a couple of things. Number one, he's moved five from the beginning to the end, honor your father and mother. He's dropped the 10th commandment, which is about greed and coveting, and he's added, love your neighbor as yourself, which is sort of the summary command for the second half of the Ten Commandments. All three of these changes are meant to show this man that something's wrong in his heart in relation to how he loves God, how he loves his parents, and especially with regard to his love for money. You see, the Ten Commandments were never designed to enable us to sort of obey fully. No one can do that. Those 10 commandments are part of a larger mosaic law in the Old Testament, 613 commands. And those are designed to show us that we're not actually able to obey God. That these commandments were not designed in such a way to get us to say, okay, look, I've done everything I need to do. They're designed to show us that no one in history outside of Jesus has ever kept all of the commands in the Ten Commandments or in the Bible, in the spirit in which they were written perfectly. Jesus is trying to get this man to recognize that, but the man doesn't. Verse 20, all these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? I think the man is thinking to himself, well, I haven't murdered anybody. I'm, I'm not stealing currently. I'm not currently telling any lies. And so he, th he thinks, I'm good. Now, if it was you and I, what we probably would do, or at least what I would do, is we'd, we'd want to bring in more commands. Oh, yeah, well, what about the Sabbath laws? Have you kept all of those? What about the food laws? Have you never broken a food law? Jesus goes the opposite direction, and instead of adding more laws, he simplifies things in a very straightforward and clear manner. Verse 21, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect meaning if you want to be complete, if you want to be mature, if you want to be assured of eternal life, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now, Jesus doesn't believe that all of us need to sell our possessions in order to have eternal life, but for this particular person, there's something going on in his heart in relation to his love of money. So Jesus says, look, let me just make this very simple for you. You're not getting the point that you're not actively keeping all of these commandments. You've missed the do not covet commandment. You're not understanding all of that. So Jesus just says, let me make this very simple for you. Go and sell all your possessions. Jesus does this to get at the true issue in the man's heart which verse 22 and following shows that he's successful in doing this. It's sad, but Jesus has gotten to the point. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. This is Jesus' point, is, is that no one gets eternal life by keeping the commandments. Eternal life is a gift from God, the things that are impossible with humans, as shown by our inability to keep God's commands. This is the gift, the one who is good, the only one who is good, God, chooses to give us freely. But the point is, for this man, he needed to love God more than money in order to receive eternal life. And so Jesus has subtly taken him through this whole uh, ordeal to get him to realize that money has a grip on his heart. He needs to let go of his love for money in order that he might love God and receive from God the gift of eternal life. Now, what about us? Well, I think we want to stop here for a moment and say to any who are listening, those who are not yet Christians, Jesus does the same thing today. It may not be money, but he often finds the one thing that we're holding on to in our heart and asks us to let go of that so that we can love God in return and receive from God the gift of eternal life. For example, maybe you're a person who wants to inherit eternal life. Maybe you're a person who's like, Listen, between the choice of everlasting contempt and everlasting life, I would like everlasting life. Could you imagine? Everlasting shame and contempt. Daniel says some will be raised to that, but some will be raised to everlasting life. If you're a person who says, I would like everlasting life, but your problem with Christianity is, is that your family disapproves of Jesus and wants you to have nothing to do with Christianity, the point is, is that for you, it's not money, it's family. And Jesus wants you to realize, look, you're going to have to let go of your family's opinions of you if you're going to embrace God. And so often Jesus is asking us to let go of something, and maybe for you today, it's family. Or maybe for you today, it's your intellectual curiosity. Just like this man was rich in money, you might be rich in intellectual ability. Maybe as you think about Christianity and you think, yes, I would like to inherit eternal life, but I've got lots of questions. I got questions about the historicity of events. I got questions about why there's so much sanctioned killing in the Old Testament. I've got questions about why it seems like things in life uh, appear to have randomly evolved instead of being created. Maybe you have lots of good intellectual questions and God has given you a mind to think. But maybe he's asking you to let go of all of those intellectual questions. It's not that there aren't answers to all of those things. It's just that God wants you to love him more than you love your own intellectual curiosity. And even if we were to give you answers to all those questions, there would be some question that you would not, that you, the answer would not satisfy you. And Jesus is asking you, will you love me more than you love your own intellectual curiosity? Or maybe you're a person who is very interested in receiving eternal life. You want to experience the blessings of the kingdom of God forever and ever, not interrupted by death but maybe you struggle with the sexual mores that God presents. Maybe you think to yourself, but I can't accept the fact that God says that, mar that sex is reserved for a monogamous heterosexual marriage. Again, for each of us, there is that thing that we are often prioritizing over God. And God says, look, if you're going to receive from me the gift of eternal life, you have to love me more then you love your family, your intellectual curiosity, your commitment to whatever uh, views of your body or those sorts of things. It can be sports, it can be success, it can be business. God must be 
our number one priority. And when he is, we receive from him the gift of eternal life. Now, for those who are Christians, you might be thinking, well, well, what about, is there any message for us in this? I've made the decision to follow Jesus. What does God have to say to me today? Well, thank you for asking. Keep going in our passage. Verse 27, Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, truly I tell you at the renewal of all things, When the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Jesus is not here talking about how do you enter into the kingdom of God. He's not talking here about how you get eternal life. He's talking about how do you thrive in eternal life. How do you thrive in the kingdom of God? How do you experience the blessings of the kingdom of God now and into eternity? And it turns out it's the exact same thing as how you enter into the kingdom of God which is God must be the first priority. And so the message for those who are already Christians is is that like this rich young ruler, there is probably something that right now Jesus is asking us to let go of so that we might love him more fully and more deeply. Peter didn't sell all of his possessions, but Peter was asked to leave family and friends and work behind to come and follow Jesus. So the question for us today is what is that thing that right now Jesus might be asking you to let go of, not because you have to let go of in order to earn your way to heaven, but because Jesus is asking you to show that you love him more than that thing. And it's going to be different for everyone. This morning, maybe for some of us, it's money. Maybe like this rich young ruler, we're holding on to a high-paying job or we're holding on to a retirement account or we're holding on to something and Jesus this morning is asking us, let that go. Not because everybody has to do it, but because he's asking us to do that. Maybe he's asking you this morning, are you willing to love me more than your bank account? And maybe he asks us to give a a large amount of money, an uncomfortable amount of money. Maybe he asks us to quit a high-paying job. Maybe he asks us to trust him financially. All of this is designed to get to show us and him that he's the priority in our life, not money. Maybe for you this morning, it's people. Maybe God wants to know that he's a priority rather than people. Maybe he's asking you to send your kids to a school you don't feel comfortable sending them to. Maybe he's asking you to take a break from your family of origin and spend less time trying to please them and more time engaging with God. Jesus wants to know that he is the priority over family and other things. Maybe it's technology. Maybe this morning Jesus wants you to let go of that phone. He wants you to just put it away and not have anything to do with it for a season. Why? Is it because phones are evil? No. But because they can take the place of having a priority in our heart and Jesus must be the first priority. Maybe it's a fear of failure. Maybe there's some assignment that Jesus is giving to you today. And he wants you to do this despite the fact that you're terrified of doing it. This is your opportunity to be able to show Jesus that you love him more than you fear failure. Maybe it's your reputation. And Jesus is asking you, will you give up your reputation to show your love for me? This is what he does. Sometimes we think to ourselves, well, I'm, I'm good. Like I go to church, I tithe, I read my Bible, I pray. We're like the rich young ruler and we think, I'm doing a good job. 
Often Jesus will bring something into our lives like he does for this rich young ruler to show that in our heart there is something that has a stronghold. Whether it be money, the affections of others, fear of failure, technology, whatever it may be. Jesus often asks for that thing to get at the fact that he must have first place in our lives. Now maybe you ask the question, do I just have to constantly be proving my love to Jesus? You know, it's interesting the way this story ends. Peter says, look, I've done that. I, I did what you asked. I gave up the one thing that meant so much to me. And Jesus responds to him, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in this life and inherit eternal life. Think about what happened with this rich young ruler. What did he get? Maybe another 30 years of life after this? We don't know how old he was. We'll just assume another 30 years of life. And guess what? He didn't have to give up any of his money. He kept his money. He probably went on some nice trips. He probably ate good meals. And he probably died a wealthy man. And unless God intervened, he was raised and will be raised from the dead to everlasting contempt. That's an incredibly high price to pay for another 30 years of being wealthy. But what about Peter? Peter gave up family, he gave up occupation, he left friends behind to come follow Jesus. He lives another 30 years after this. What does he receive? He gets to see the coming of the Holy Spirit. He gets miraculous release from prison. He gets to see people raised from the dead. He sees thousands and thousands of people come to faith. He receives back from Jesus in this life over those 30 years, 100 times as much in relationships and in family and in experiences and in connection with God. And when Jesus returns, Peter will sit on one of the thrones ruling over one of the tribes of Israel and on into eternity he will continue to receive the rewards of putting Jesus as the first priority. And my sense is when Peter is raised from the dead to everlasting life he will thank Jesus every day for asking him to give up family and friends, occupation and home. The reason why Jesus is asking for these things from us is not because he's got some sort of, he's some sort of egomaniac that he always has to constantly be proving our love to him. He knows that money, technology, football, family, success, business, those things don't bring life. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. If this morning Jesus is asking you to choose him over that thing, it's because ultimately he will bring blessing. That thing won't. And Jesus knows that our pursuit of money, our pursuit of approval of others, our pursuit of our family of origin and everything being fine there, our pursuit of other people, our pursuit of success, in the end, that doesn't bring life. Jesus is the source of life. I have no idea if Jim Harbaugh has thought through any of these kinds of things. I don't know what kind of sacrifices he may have had to make to have faith be a priority, but I do know at some point, whether sooner or later, God will ask him to give up football and choose Jesus. He'll be doing that because football in the end will fail him. Football will not actually bring life. Jesus will. And so this morning Jesus is asking each of us, what is that thing that's standing in the way of experiencing the fullness of the blessings of God? Jesus says, if you will give that to me, if you will choose me over that, you will receive in this life a hundred times as much and in the age to come, eternal life. And so the question I leave you with this morning, 
For those who are not yet Christians, what is that thing that you're holding on to that is keeping you from embracing Jesus? If you'll let go of that thing, whether it's your own intellectual curiosity, whether it's your understanding of sexual ethics, whether it's your ability to grapple with the things that God is asking you to do, whether it's the approval of others, if you will let go of that and embrace Jesus, you will receive from him eternal life. And for those who are Christians, what is that thing this morning that Jesus is asking you to let go of because it doesn't bring life to embrace him instead so that you might receive a hundred times as much and in the age to come, eternal life. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for this time. God, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray now that your Holy Spirit would do what only your Holy Spirit can do is in the homes of the people who are listening and the recordings of this message, that right now you would bring conviction to our hearts and help us to understand what is that thing that today we need to let go of so that we might love you more fully. What is that thing that we have cherished that's a blessing from you, perhaps, that we need to let go of so that we might have more of you? Jesus, thank you for calling us out of things that do not bring life and asking us to embrace you. Give us the courage to obey. Help us to see, Jesus, that you are calling us to life, to blessing, to thriving. And Lord, I pray by faith uh, that those who are wrestling this morning with that one thing, that they would let go of that and embrace you and that you would be the top priority in our lives. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. May God bless you and have a wonderful Sunday.